were so many toy tropes that came out of the 1980s in many ways. You could argue that it was the most innovative era for toy creation ever. And although there were some classics that came out of that decade, it's the 80s gross out toys that are always some of my personal favourites. We had the blurp balls, we had the gross out gang, but there's one line of 80s gross out toys that always take the top spot for me. And there were a line of toys that in time became the very definition of the gross out genre. And they were called the Mad Balls. Released in 1986 by Amtoy, the first ever run of the original Mad Balls toys consisted of nine different characters, all with their own distinct features and aesthetics, but all very much gross out themed and all in the shape of a squishy foam ball. Now, I'm probably going to use the term gross out toys a lot in this episode. And it's, it's gross! Yeah! Gross out refers to a particular type of style that became popular in the 1980s. Garbage pail kids eating their own brains, boglins barfing up all over themselves, characters with staples stuck in their faces and their eyeballs hanging out, blood, pus, slime, all that good shit. It was a type of real tongue-in-cheek, light-hearted horror that kids could enjoy rather than be scared of. A disgusting trading card that we could freak our little sisters and brothers out with. A freaky monster toy friend that felt like it had our backs rather than something that we had to check under our beds for. Hey, the name's Bob. Let's keep sold separately and we're looking for good homes. Maybe you're... There are so many toys that could fit into the category of gross out and it's still a type of toy that's super popular to this day. But whenever I personally think of gross out action figures, which is probably more often than most people, it's the Mad Balls that always come to mind as the ultimate gross out toy. Mad Balls. Mad Balls. Freaky fun for everyone, so... Now there's many reasons why I think the Mad Balls were so appealing to kids at the time and to collectors still to this day, but to me one of the main things I like about them is the fact that no matter how weird and grotesque they were, or how detailed the sculpting was on them, they were all still strictly confined to the shape of a ball. So all the designers that were creating them had to bring a whole character to life with their own story and vibes, but all within the limitations and simplicity of that basic sphere shape. And that in itself is such a cool idea to me. Over the years, I've collected a bunch of cool Mad Bulls, bowls and merchandise, both new and old official and knockoff and as much as i love all of it my all-time favorite mad balls release is by far the head poppers hands up mad ball, mad ball. welcome to the wacky world of mad ball action figures a world of good guys attack skull face get on this brain off with your head i give it so much now it had only been a year since the original Mad Balls were released, but by this time they had a ton of merchandise, including their own comic book series and animated cartoon, both developing the characters much further than just a bunch of balls with crazy faces, and with the action figure market being so prolific at the time, it made a ton of sense for the Mad Balls creators to put arms, legs and bodies on their characters and release their own line of Mad Balls action figures, and that's when we got their head poppers. Now there's nine of them all together and I absolutely love these guys. They're literally up there with my favourite toy designs ever and they sit in my office as one of the prized pieces of my toy collection. So what I want to do today is go through them all individually, talk a little bit about why I dig them so much and what I think personally makes them all so special. So first off we've got this guy, Dustbrain. He's a let one of the most recognisable out of all of the Mad Balls. And even though he looks very much like a traditional spooky Halloween Egyptian style mummy, he's still got enough about him to feel very much like his own unique gross out character. He's got stitches in his skin with a zipper across his chest. You can see that he's got his ribs exposed at the back. And he's also got a safety pin holding together his tattered old bandages. Funny because that's often a look in cartoons that's associated with a baby's diaper which could also be a play on the fact that the dimensions of these toys' bodies look like that of big mutant babies, like they've got no neck or waist, they've got proper little dumpling proportions. 
Also, I know I keep saying this guy, but in the animated cartoon, this guy was actually a girl. So in that video, Dustbrain was a gender-swapped female character, and she had these big red kissy lips and eyelashes. Imagine if they did that nowadays, people would be kicking off saying that it was modern-day woke. Even though this was done back in 1986, and nobody battered an eyelid or gave a shit. Great. With that block, we can finish this too. So what do you know about this guy? Screaming Mimi. Another one of them super recognisable Mad Balls characters. Was always a standout for me personally. So if you haven't already worked out from my super easy to understand accent, I'm British. I was born and raised in Northern England. And over here, baseball isn't really a thing. The only connection we have to baseball was seeing it in movies like Richie Rich and The Sandlot and Three Ninjas Kickback. So this guy always had that little bit of extra intrigue for me. He was also the first sports themed Mad Ball, something that would be a continued idea in other characters later on down the line. He's essentially a mutant baseball player whose head is a giant screaming baseball. His clothes are all tattered and torn like he's been in a fire or an acid bath. He's rocking the unlucky to some number 13 on his jersey and on one of his hands he wears a baseball catcher's glove. He's got his grim little toes sticking out of his shoes. He's covered in cuts and slices that have been brutally stitched back together. But what I love most about this character is that fucking facial expression. It's like the sculptor that created him captured the exact moment perfectly when his head was being thrown through the air and his eyelids and lips and cheeks were being pushed back by the wind and the g-force. And that flapping tongue, it's so perfect. As a kid, our parents would tell us to stop pulling stupid faces because if the wind changed, it would stay that way. And whenever my mom would say that to me, this is honestly what I remember thinking that would look like. Bruise brother, check this mad bastard with the fucked up teeth and the busted eye. I know a few guys in my estate that look like this. He's got gashes and cuts all over his skin with bloodied knuckles like he just rocked up fresh from a gang brawl or a knife fight. Then with that German paratrooper piss pot helmet combined with the studded wristbands, he looks like a mix between an old school 70s biker and a Mad Max character. He's got bullet holes and slashes in his helmet with blood pouring out of him. He's got a snake plissken eye patch and a safety pin holding his cheek together. This guy's hard as nails. He rolls shirtless with nothing but a bullet bandolier around his torso. He's got tattoos and his trousers are held up with nothing but a piece of string. A piece of string that also holds a knife and scabbard around the back. It's interesting to note that Bruce Brother is the only head popper that's strapped with a weapon. Another indicator that this dude is either gang or violent biker club affiliated. Or maybe he's just one of those gnarly guys that always brings the chaos with him. Either way, I love that he's the only one who could even remotely fit into the category of someone that looks somewhat human, but he's still just as much of a monster as the rest of them. Like, he's that one human that's accepted amongst these weird creatures and seen as an equal because he's just as fucked up as they are. What an absolute hero. Now check this guy, Lock Lips. Whatever information this guy holds, somebody crazy out there really didn't want anybody else to hear it. And if you're going to feel pity for any of the head poppers, Lock Lips is definitely the one that deserves our sympathy. He looks like he's been captured, chained up, tortured and experimented on. His nose has been completely sliced off his face. He's got metal plating bolted into pretty much every inch of his body. He's been sliced and carved up. His brain is bursting out the back of his head. He's got mould growing down the side of his face. They took one of his eyes. I don't know what this guy's story is, but somebody really did a number on him. And when I look at Lock Lips, I get Castle Freak vibes. I see a creature that's been caged and beaten and mistreated for years and years. Look, he's even got hinges and metal screwed into his fingers and toes. What did this guy do wrong? Why does he need so many different types of padlocks to keep him subdued? I do like to think, though, that whatever his story is, that he's somehow thriving under the circumstances. He's been shackled and left to rot, but now he's free and he's being the best rotten zombie slimy mutant sewer monster that he can be. Aesthetically, to me, this guy is the perfect mix of traditional horror and 80s gross out, and he fits perfectly in with the other head poppers. Lock lips. What a guy. Another character that I always felt was similar to Lock Lips was this guy, Slobulus. Another green melting zombie man. 
But while Locklips looks like he's someone that's been captured and abused, Slobulus almost looks like a guy that fell to pieces and then someone tried to help put him back together. I remember spending hours as a kid looking at this guy, wishing that his eyeball was a separate piece so that I could push it back up into its socket. Such a weird kid. He's again someone that's covered in metal plates and stitches and open sores and wounds. But if you look at his back, he's got his entire spine exposed. Like he fell asleep on a belt sander. This guy looks like he's been fucking blood eagled. Slobulus reminds me of one of those people that no matter what you try to do to help them, they're always going to go back to their old ways and get messed up in one way or another. It's like somebody tried to fix this guy up, sew him back together and help him, but deep down he's just destined to be a melty slime monster that inevitably just falls to pieces anyway. Out of all of the mad balls, this guy is definitely the one that looks like he's struggling to hold himself together the most, and you can tell that the sculptors went all out on this guy and lock lips when it came to all those extra little gross art details that make this such a standout toy line. Wolf's Breath. So this guy's the werewolf of the pack. Although I'm pretty sure that he's just a wolfman now permanently because I've never personally seen him in human form in any of the media that he's been featured in. He also looks like he's been taking fashion tips from his boy Bruce brother with the string holding his trousers up and check them teeth crooked as shit and covered in blood. This guy's turned up fresh from a feed and judging by the looks of things, dude's ready for seconds. Just like most of the other head poppers, he's also covered in cuts and wounds. He's been sliced all the way down to his arse and they've stapled him back up without even taking his trousers off. Just stuck staples straight through the cloth of his pants and left him to it. Also, I love that he's put this little band-aid over a cut that's on his finger. Yet round the back of his head, it looks like someone set upon him with a meat cleaver. Split all his head and he's got this big bleeding open gash that he doesn't even seem phased by. <laughs> These guys don't feel pain! Now, lots of popular toy lines from the 1980s had some kind of skeleton dude in them, and Madballs was no exception. He-Man had Skeletor, Thundercats had Mumra, and the Madballs had this guy, Skullface. And in my opinion, this guy is hands down one of the dopest out of all of them. I love how his eyes are like heart shapes turned on their side with these little tiny red beady eyeballs in him and that huge mouth. It looks like he's got maggots and bugs living inside of his head, and he's casting this real nice stained bone colour. He's also only very vaguely anatomically similar to a human skeleton. His bone is so dense and chunky, he almost looks like some kind of armour. And his legs are so clustered, it's as if the bone that's there has grown into some kind of tumour. When I look at this guy, I get Elephant Man vibes. The sculpt on him is so bang on. They made such a good use of the template and shape that all these guys are based on when they made this guy's skull face. This toy makes me want to track down the guy that sculpted it, shake his hand and tell him what a fucking boss man he is. The final Madball head popper out of the main single figure releases is by far my favourite out of all of them. This character, Oculus Orbus. His most striking feature obviously being his head, one that's completely made up of a giant veiny eyeball. I've always loved toys that had big eyeballs featured as part of the design, and the 80s and the 90s had some spectacular ones, but this guy by far is the coolest out of all of them, the benchmark of eyeball toys. I've also always been a huge fan of graffiti art, and growing up reading subway art and spray can art, there was a couple of flying eyeball warriors painted by Scene and Kid Panama on a New York train car, and I always thought they were so cool and they always reminded me of this mad ball. I remember going fucking nuts one time when I first saw the Mishka baseball cap with the supreme eyeball on the front of it because it reminded me so much of Oculus Orbis and I spent all night hunting one down so I could get one imported from America because I couldn't sleep until I had one. I went on to become a massive fan of the Mishka brand, even visiting their store in Harajuku in Tokyo and making friends with the staff there and it's all because of how much I love this action figure. His body is made up of exposed blooded muscle that looks as though it's had all its skin peeled off and flayed proper Hellraiser vibes. And I love how his head and his torso are so different to each other yet they work in unison so perfectly. I'm often asked what my favourite toy of all time is and although it's a super close call and a question that I can never really answer properly, this dude Oculus Orbis is always up there with what I believe is one of the greatest action figures of all time, bar none. 
So most popular action figure series at the time had some kind of playset or vehicle to accompany their toy release, and Mad Balls was no exception. Although they never did get a playset, and side note, just think how fucking incredible that would have been, they did get this thing, the Mad Roller Cycle. The Mad Roller Cycle is effectively a chunky looking Ed Big Daddy Roth style Roadhog Hot Rod Trike that looks like it's been built out of random junk from a scrapyard and as cool as it is as a standalone piece with its big bold simple colours and pretty tacky looking stickers it could look like at a first glance it's not even got anything to do with the Mad Balls line. The details that it does have, although they're obviously very skillfully sculpted and engineered, don't really have any of that gross out factor that the action figures do. There's no brains or slime pouring out of the air vents or exhaust pipes. There's no bullet holes, rust or slashes in any of the bodywork. I think if you found this thing in a bin at a car boot or a flea market without any stickers on and having never seen it before, the Mad Balls line is probably the last thing that you think it's part of. Like the figure's hands don't even grip the handlebars. But what it lacks in a coherent design to the figures, it makes up for in other ways. Like having this catapult function, letting you launch the Mad Bulls heads across the room like some medieval king, firing messengers heads back over the castle walls to an invading army. The cycle also has this basketball hoop where you can store a Mad Bulls head and a seat at the back with a trigger feature that lets you sit a guy down, lock him in place and fire his head off with this little skull lever. Fucking awesome. By far though, the best thing about the Mad Roller Cycle in my opinion is that it came with its very own exclusive action figure. The final character in the series, one that was never released on his own, the only way you could get it was by buying this Mad Roller Cycle, which in turn nowadays makes him one of the hardest to find, and it's this guy, Hornhead. Hornhead is a character straight out of a Ray Harryhausen movie, taking what looks to me like obvious inspiration from the famous Cyclops in the seventh voyage of Sinbad. I've always been a massive fan of Ray Harryhausen Dynamation movies and his creature design. I've got every movie that he worked on, I've read his books cover to cover and I was even lucky enough to meet him when I was 19 before he passed away. This is a guy who inspired so many artists, filmmakers and creatives in so many different ways and it's crazy to think that he could have also had a hand in the inspiration behind one of the Mad Balls. With all that being said though, this Cyclops Hornhead is still very much his own thing. I dig the colour scheme they went for, like that dark plum purple with the big yellow and red eye. They punked him up with the bullring piercing in his nose and they gave him cuts and stitches and staples, making him fit in right alongside the other Mad Balls in the series perfectly. It's also interesting to note that the horn head that features on the box art of the cycle is a little bit different to the one that we actually got. The one on the box looks a little bit more like his original foam ball counterpart. It must have been some kind of concept design. I really like this one as well. It would be so cool to see that one in real life. And if we're talking about packaging art in particular, the graphics on this box are pretty plain. There's a photograph of the roller cycle on the front. Round the back, there's a group photo of all of the Mad Balls gang. So in regards to this box in particular, it's pretty much all just photographs. As opposed to the card backs of the actual action figures themselves, which does actually have some really cool artwork on it, but they are still overall pretty plain and pretty blank. These toys were also released around the world in other different countries and territories. And as cool as the artwork is on our versions of the card backs, none of it even comes close to the Japanese version of the artwork. Check that shit! I wish we could have had this artwork on our release of the Mad Balls. Obviously, it's all down to whoever had the license to release it in their specific territory at the time, and they would go with their own artists. But why couldn't we have just got a little bit of that artwork over on the Western releases? It's so cool! I suppose it's just one of those many unanswered questions that accompany the Mad Balls that I'll never get an answer to. Like if the Mad Balls are all from another planet called Planet Orb, then why is one of them an embalmed Egyptian mummy? Do they have Egyptians there? Why are they all carved up and stitched together? Who did this to them? Are they dead? Is Planet Orb some kind of purgatory? Why is Oculus one giant eyeball but the rest of the Mad Balls have eyes that are in proportions to their heads? Is Oculus the eye of a giant? What the fucking hell's going on? How do they know the lyrics to Great Balls of Fire? Goodness gracious, Great Balls of Fire! <laughs> 
I suppose they're just more unanswered questions that all get lost in a sea of confusing retro kids pop culture. Like, why do the Transformers speak English, even though they existed millions of years before humans did? Where does Spider-Man's web attach to when he's swinging above buildings? How does Casey Jones snag a job at an interview while wearing a hockey mask with a bag of weapons on his back? It's all ridiculous, but it's all part of the charm of why we love this stuff, why these questions don't ever need answering, and why I personally wouldn't have it any other way. Now there's one thing that I haven't really spoken about too much in this video, and it's actually the main selling point of the Mad Balls head poppers. The fact that their little heads pop off when you pull this trigger on their back. And it's a technology that hasn't really stood the test of time. The springs in these things do wear, so that now when you've got them displayed, the heads just ping off randomly. I even stopped displaying these things in cabinets because sometimes they would just fly off and destroy everything else that was inside the shelf. I've even been asleep in the middle of the night at four in the morning, dreaming about that ultimate holy grail hole that all us toy collectors dream about, when all of a sudden, I hear a little noise in my house, a little ruckus, and I live alone, so I'm a light sleeper, so I jump out of bed, thinking that I'm being fucking burgled, grab my baseball bat, and I slowly creep onto my landing hallway, and I'm making my way down the corridor, about to smash a home invader's head in, thinking this is the last house this person's ever gonna burgle, and then I think, I'll just have a little look inside the toy room, so I pop my head inside my office, and I look up to where my Mad Balls head poppers are displayed, to see that one of the heads is missing and then I look down and then I see the little mad balls head staring back at me on the floor and I'm just like for fuck's sake now I have actually seen that some people have been repurposing reproducing and remaking the components for these with much sturdier springs so that you can display them with the heads on but luckily the most recent set that I've acquired and that I've got displayed all seem pretty well behaved pretty sturdy and haven't flung off in the middle of the night yet so until then I'll just have to keep my eye on them Now, like I've said many times in this video, the Mad Bulls are still one of my favourite toy lines of all time. Everything about them is so perfect and over the years they've been a huge influence on me personally, both with my artwork and my toy making, subliminally and also sometimes as a direct point of reference. What was also once seen as a pretty niche toy line to add to your collection has in recent years become a lot more popular. The Mad Bulls seemed to have a good couple of decades where they were seen as a very obscure toy line to collect, but then over the past few years they've slowly crept and bounced and rolled back into the modern day toy world with collabs with companies like Kid Robot, a recent crossover with their fellow 80s cousins in Gross Out the Garbage Pail Kids, and even a cameo in a Steven Spielberg movie. Their much welcomed return and reign of terror on both our toy collections and our wallets doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. But no matter how big they get, it will always be these OG Mad Balls that mean the most to me personally. These were the 80s originals. The dudes that let little strange kids like me know that it was cool to be a weirdo. The freaks that loved being freaks. The baseballs for kids who didn't play baseball. They were zombies. They were monsters. They were mad balls. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider giving it a like. And if you haven't already, have a look at subscribing to the channel. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on this video. So let me know in the comments below. Is there anything that I talked about that sparked a memory that you can relate to? Are you a fan of Mad Balls and 80s gross out toys? Do you have any Mad Balls memories? Or is there any other toys that you'd like to see me cover in a future video? As you can imagine, these videos take me a long time to create. I like to try and keep the production quality as high as possible, but it takes a long time. This video took me over a month to make from shooting it and then scripting it and narrating it cleaning the little hairs off their sticky little mad balls heads with a paintbrush under a macro lens filming intros and outros all this stuff takes a real long time so if you want to help support that you can head over to patreon.com forward slash slime house tv and for as little as a dollar a month you can become a slime renegade and help me make these videos bigger and better than ever and keep making them i'm also on instagram so if you want to get at me on there i'm very active on my ig it's at Theo underscore Kane underscore Slimehouse. I'm looking forward to making the next video. I've got some really cool stuff planned for you. But until then, my name's Theo Kane. This is Slimehouse TV, and I'll catch you in the next video soon. Pow!